Hello, everybody, and welcome to my first time home buyer master class. I appreciate you all joining me. Uh, I know some of you are watching live right now on Zoom. Some will be watching this recorded uh, on my YouTube channel. So either way, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So we've got uh, a good group of people that are here live, some, some names I recognize, and, and a few that I, I hope to get to know in the future. Uh, and uh, also, obviously, everybody that's watching recorded, if you have questions about anything, please post those questions. If you're watching live, I'll pay attention to the chat in Zoom and I'll address those questions as appropriate. If you're watching recorded, no problem. Just post the questions into the comments of YouTube and I'll go back and I'll address those questions later and reply to your comments uh, through the YouTube uh, comment section. So let's go ahead and kick this off and get started. Uh, this is a monthly masterclass that I do. The first portion is different every single month. Uh, I have a different topic that I talk about. Uh, so it's really broken up into three parts. I talk about a specific topic for the month. Uh, I'll talk about what's going on in the market and explaining market dynamics, the second part, market dynamics, what's happening with the market. Um, and is it a good time to buy? What are housing prices doing and interest rates? And so I'm gonna cover all of that stuff. And then I also cover uh, the last portion is uh, the same thing every time. And that is the process of buying a home. So if this is your first time joining me for my masterclass, make sure you stay all the way through. If you've joined before, uh, I'll let you know when I'm going to repeat content. And when I start at that point, feel free to stick around because it's always good to hear things repetitively. Listening to something a couple of times over definitely helps it sink in. But if you've listened already and you've got that part, you can go ahead and check out then. But until then, I want to again encourage you, let's make this as interactive as we possibly can. So any questions you have about anything at all, feel free to jump in and ask. So let's get started with the topic of the month. And that is, how much money do I need for a down payment? That's a question I get a lot. And I get really um, uh, a lot of mixed answers from people. And so I'm going to spend a fair amount of the first part of this conversation talking about what money do we need for a down payment? I'm actually going to stop my share because I'm just going to talk and I'm going to kind of share with you a little bit about what I think about this and where people misunderstand. The first thing I'll tell you is most people think they need more money than they actually need. And this is perpetuated, uh, perpetuated by the media giving some false information. A lot of people think, oh, those, those low down payment programs, those are only for first time home buyers. Some of them are, but most of them actually are not. And a matter of fact, most of you watching this are probably first time home buyers anyway. But I have regularly run into people who still think they need to have 10 or 20% for a down payment when purchasing a home. As a matter of fact, there's some financial experts that say buying a home with less than 20% down payment is a horrible idea and you should never, ever do it. I think they have a really good point. Now, I'm not telling you you should have, wait until you have a 20% down payment, but they have a really good point because when you put 20% down, you get to relief from paying for what's called mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance is a fee that you pay every single month and it does nothing for you. It protects the bank. It protects the bank because if we rewind decades ago, when the housing industry was, was really becoming more institutionalized by the federal government, they created, the federal government created Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And they also created the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration. And these departments basically stepped in and covered what a regular bank wouldn't. Because a regular bank would say, you know, hey, you want to buy a house for $10,000? That's great. You put in two, I'll put in eight. And that way you got some skin in the game. Now, mind you, a long time ago, the houses were $10,000. But they wanted you to have skin in the game. The fact of the matter is the federal government realized there are a lot of people who can and should be homeowners that are having an, a hard time becoming a homeowner because they can't save up that money. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you something here. Uh, let me share this right now, as a matter of fact. Um, I've got a uh, chart here that I found with the New York Times. So let me share my screen. Share. I'm going to share that guy right there. All right. So there's a chart the New York Times put out. And they said, um, how long does it take to save up 20% based on the median income of that city 
and based upon the average purchase price in that city. And what you're going to see in this chart is pretty shocking, as a matter of fact. At least it was to me. Um, and what we're going to see is we're going to see, let's pull my little spotlight tool out here. There you go. All right. So we're going to see the fastest areas to save up 20% down. Detroit. Now, this was uh, published in January of 2023. So Detroit, the median price of a home was $88,900. And therefore, your 20% down payment was $17,780. And based on the average income in Detroit, it took about two and a half years of savings in order to get to 20% down. That's the shortest amount of time in the United States based on this chart that the New York Times put out. Now, of the shortest time frames, Montgomery, Alabama is the worst of the best at three and a half years to save for your down payment. But let's get to the other end of the spectrum. The absolute worst market to save money for 20% down is Glendale, California. So we're talking Southern California, Los Angeles area, where the average home median home price is $1.125 million. And your 20% down is $225,000. Based on the average income within that market, it takes them 15 years to save 20% for a down payment. And guess what you're doing that entire time? You're paying rents. You're giving money to your landlord every single month, hoping you can get enough money to save up for the down payment. Let's look at a couple other markets here again, Southern California, Southern California, San Francisco. So these are on the most extreme end, but the most extreme end is 10 to 15 years to save for a down payment. The least extreme, the fastest is two and a half to three and a half years. So where do most of us lie? Well, right in between there, somewhere between three and a half and 10 years to buy a home. And so it becomes the question of, do I wait to buy a home? Do I set aside my money every single month and wait for that moment that I'm going to buy a home? And what you're doing is, is noble. And a lot of people have done that and built up a nest egg. The problem is the price of homes keeps chasing higher. And when they said, oh my gosh, I, I got enough for a down payment now on a $200,000 home. By the time you took five years to save up that down payment, the average price of a home is now $350,000. And you don't have enough money to put the down payment on 350, so you keep saving. And by the time you're done saving, the average price is $420,000. And you don't have enough money for $420,000. It's a perpetual cycle. You end up getting way behind. And so my worry when people say, yeah, I want to save up 20% down, I think that's great because you're going to have a lower monthly payments and you're not gonna pay mortgage insurance. Now I'll talk in a minute about what mortgage insurance is and is it really a bad thing or not, but I agree 100% that you should put 20% down if you can, if you have the money to put down now, go for it, you are way better off. But if you have to wait, if you say, John, I've only got 5% for a down payment, so I know I'm not ready to buy a home because my financial guru said I needed 20% down to buy a home. The problem is you're chasing and appreciating assets. You're trying to catch up with a train that's going 100 miles an hour down the track, and you're sitting in the depot watching it go whoosh, right past you. And it's super frustrating. It's super frustrating to see your friends and your family who purchased a home 10 years ago. And their monthly payment for their house has gone down. It's gone down not only in real dollars, but their incomes kept going up and their actual payment for their house has gone down because they've been able to refinance to take advantage of lower interest rates and get a lower monthly payment. So it's super frustrating when you have the misbelief that you have to save up a huge amount of money for a down payment. The truth is you can get into a home with as little as two or three thousand dollars. I'm not kidding. You can get into a home with as little as two or three thousand dollars. There are programs that can help you not only with your down payment, but can help you pay your closing costs. Those are some of the challenges people run into is it's okay, John, I've saved up my 10% down payment on a four hundred thousand dollar home. So I've got my 40 grand and I know that that's what I needed was 10% down to get the, the, the program, get the interest rate I'm looking for. The problem is you didn't account for closing costs. Your closing costs are probably another 3% of your purchase price. 
So to save for 10% down, you actually need to save 13% of the purchase price. To save for 20% down, you actually need 23% of the purchase price. Now, the smallest down payment the average person can get is between three and three and a half percent down. But that means you're really coming up with six or six and a half percent. That's the simplest math. It is not universally applied. There's lots of exceptions to it. But in general, if you're going to use no special programs, if you're not going to ask the seller to help pay for your closing costs, then about six to six and a half percent of the purchase price is what you need to save. So, and that's what you need is a minimum down payment. Now, if you don't have that money, stay tuned because I'm gonna share with you some ways that you can overcome that. But the fact of the matter is, if you say, John, my target is a $500,000 home, and I've heard you on your YouTube videos before talk about the fact that down payment assistance isn't free money. And therefore, I want to come up with my own down payment money. How much do I need to buy a $500,000 home? you really should probably estimate about six to 7% of the purchase price. So on a $500,000 home, we're talking about 30 to $35,000 total. So it's important to understand that math because you're not simply trying to save for your down payments. You have to have money for your down payment and your closing costs. Now, as we get further into this presentation and I go through the last segment that talks about the home buying process from start to finish, I cover with you exactly how much you need for down payment, what the different loan programs are that allow for different down payment amounts. So I'm gonna stay really high level right now and simply say, when you think about how much money you need for a down payment, first of all, it's likely less than what you were expecting. Secondly, you need to make sure though that you're estimating for closing costs. Okay, so that's really, really critical. So now the question becomes, okay, well, so what if I have to wait? three or four or five years to buy a home. I've, I've waited this long, so I'm gonna go ahead and wait. Well, the question becomes a question of timing and it becomes a question of really, and I'm gonna intersperse a little bit the, the topic, the second topic I always talk about, which is now a good time to buy a home. And I wanna cover some charts this, this month. And so I'm gonna share my screen again, and I'm gonna share with you some charts that kind of dive into what home prices have done over the years because the best way to predict the future is to look at the past. And I think that's a really important thing. Uh, what, what do they say in the, uh, in the TV commercials for investments? Prior performance does not predict future results. That's a true statement, but it usually sounds pretty similar. You know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. It sounds a lot like what happened previously. And so when we look at this, what you're looking at right now is a chart of the median home sales price in the United States for the last... Uh, 55 years, six, almost 60 plus years. So we're going back to 1963. And what do you notice? You notice house prices continue to go up. Now, this is very zoomed out. And when you've got something that's zoomed out this far, it's hard to see the nuances. But what, you, and I'll dive in a little bit and give you some, some close ups. But what you're seeing here is you're seeing that home prices continue to rise over time. And people worry, especially as you get to right now, and you're like, oh my gosh. In the fourth quarter of 2022, we hit the peak, and now we're way down from that peak. That's a true statement. We are way down from that peak. But the truth is, that doesn't look a lot different. If you look at how zoomed this is, if I zoom in and I show you right now a look at, oh, went a little bit too far. No, I didn't. That's perfect. So let's go back here and let's look at kind of what the market looks like. Let's see. Sorry, guys. I want to make sure I got my right timeline here. Let's go back just a little bit. And what you see right here in 2008, people worry, oh my gosh, we're dealing with exactly the same thing because we hit this peak. Prices kept going up and up and up and they hit a peak and then they came way down. So that's the same kind of a peak we're seeing right now. They hit a peak, they came way down. But what you'll notice is they somewhat leveled off. And they come down a little bit more, but over time, they start coming back up. So this peak happened in uh, the first part of 2007. And if we fast forward to 2012, the median home price in the United States is back to the 2013. 
So we're talking about six years. Everybody says, oh my gosh, this was so horrible how much housing prices dropped. And they went really far down from the beginning of 2007 until they hit the bottom at the beginning of 2009. In two years, prices dropped a whole lot, okay? Uh, by the way, I got a question, uh, Roshan, I'll, I'll answer your question in just a second. Um, so in two years, prices dropped a whole lot, but then they started leveling off and everybody's worried about, oh my gosh, it's gonna keep going down and they didn't buy. <laughs> and they didn't buy, and they didn't buy. And then they saw it start falling again. Yep, here it comes again. This is the next drop. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, at that point, housing prices went on a tear. And if we fast forward right here, this looks like what's happened right now. <clears throat> what you're looking at right here is not 2023. This is 2017. And everybody said, oh my gosh, prices were as low as they were going to be in 2009. And now they've climbed above the 2007 peak. And they've said, this is not sustainable. We can't maintain these prices. These house prices have to come back down. And in the beginning of 2017, I'm sorry, the end of 2017, early 2018, they did. And everybody said, yep, that's exactly what we thought was going to happen. Here they go down a little bit more and they dropped even more. So through 2018, we saw house prices drop. Now, if you know anything about the housing market, and I got a few realtors on here right now, you know that 2018 <laughs> was a great time to buy a home. So if you could rewind to 2018 and buy a house, that would be a wonderful decision. The problem is in 2018, they didn't have the ability to see into the future. <clears throat> so everybody's worried about what's happening today. They're worried about where the market is today must mean that's where it's going to go. And here we <clears throat> hit a peak in 2017. Prices had gone up. Remember, we had dropped all the way down to the average price of 208. And if I rewind back a little bit here, this peak in 2007 was 257,000 average price for a home in the United States. And it fell from 257 to 208, almost a 20% drop in house prices. And then we hit 2018 and we see another peak. And we see that they're at 337. How the heck is that sustainable when it was at 260 back in 2007? This can never last. Prices are going to drop. It's a horrible time to purchase a home. And guess what? Prices did drop. They went from 337 and they fell. And they fell down to 313. And then they went up a little bit and they fell again. And they said, oh man, this is really, really bad. But if we keep moving forward, you get all the way through 2020 and we never hit that peak again. So somebody who bought right here in the end of 2017, here they are at the end of 2019. And they're like, oh my gosh, I made the worst decision in my life. I bought a home. My family told me 10 years ago, home ownership is horrible and I should never do it because here I am two years later and this house that I bought for 337 is now worth 327 or worst case right here, it's worth 313,000. And they're saying, man, this was just a horrible idea, but it's about time. It's about time in the market because watch what happens. Everybody's worried right here that things are gonna get horrible. Just like they worried right here, things are gonna get bad. And they weren't as bad as whatever you thought. You see the same pattern. Prices go up, they come down, they stay stable. And here we are, they start going up. And what do you see now? You see prices went up a whole lot. So this didn't look like a bad deal. This looked like a great time to buy compared to where we are right now. So let's, uh, Roshan asked me, um, uh, how do we calculate debt ratio in today's market? Um, so debt ratio, I'll get to debt ratio in a little bit, Roshana. So that's, that's a great question. I'm going to cover that as part of my general topic about how to buy a home. So how is this sustainable? How can we keep home prices so high because nobody can afford it? Well, here's how. This is a chart of the median family income. Again, going back, this one's going back to 1953. And the average family income was in the $4,000 range. And it keeps going up and it keeps going up. And it keeps going up. So we saw house prices. As a matter of fact, we saw interest rates, which is a, a better thing to look at. Interest rates kept falling. So from 1981 until 2021, end of 2021, we regularly saw interest rates going down and down and down and down. Now, again, when we look at just one little uh, uh, area of time and we look right here, we might say, oh my gosh, interest rates went up during that time frame. So here we can zoom into that time frame and it says interest rates went up a lot during that time frame. And this is horrible for interest rates. But when we zoom back out, we realize that's not so bad for interest rates. 
That little spark of time right in here was just part of the ups and downs. And when we look at the big picture, we're just doing the same thing. We're part of the ups and downs of interest rates. But if somebody purchased their home, I'm gonna fast forward here, and I'm gonna put us to 2010. Somebody purchased their home in 2010, they had an interest rate in the 4% range. And they were able to refinance in 2013 to get about a 3.5% interest rate. And if they missed that opportunity and they bought here, or again, 4.5, they had a shot again in 2016 to refinance in the threes. And if they missed that opportunity, they had an opportunity again to refinance in 2019 to be in the threes. So 3% was a pretty average interest rate. And it would jump up to 5 and jump back down to three and a quarter. And it would jump back up to four and a half and it would jump back down to three and a half. And it would jump back up to five and it would jump back down to three and a quarter. That's a normal market. Then COVID hit, not a normal market. We saw interest rates plummet for a year. We saw the lowest rates we've ever seen of 2.65%. But if we ignore COVID right now, and we simply look at the time here from 2010 to 2019, People had a lot of opportunities to lower their monthly payment on their mortgage. And their income during that same time from 2000, and actually let's just do it this way, 2010 to 2019, what did their incomes do the entire time? So their interest rate, they had three different opportunities to get a four different opportunities to get a lower interest rate, yet the entire time their income kept going up People, your house payment goes down over time. Your rent payment goes up. That's really, really important. So here's something I want to show you. This is the culmination of everything I just said. And this is why the housing market, one of the reasons why the housing market is not going to crash. Because in 2007, when the market crashed, by the way, this chart is called the mortgage debt service payment. So how much is your monthly payment on your mortgage as a percentage of disposable income? So we take income, how much money is the average person making? And then we're comparing it to how much money is that average person paying in a mortgage payment? And we hit the peak. So going from 1982, <clears throat> we kept going up and up and up. And people's mortgage payment became a bigger percentage of their income. Hit a peak in 1990, came down a little bit, and houses became more affordable as a monthly payment. And then they shot up again in the early 2000s, and they hit the peak when? right when the market crashed because people were over leveraged. They were spending a lot of money on their monthly payment and more importantly, doing it on a variable interest rates. So they were setting themselves up for disaster. But now as we think about what's happened over the last 14 years, actually 16 years, we've seen the average house payment compared to people's income because remember, their income kept going up their interest rate kept going down. They had the opportunity. They didn't, if you refinance here, who cares if rates went back up because you refinance. If you bought here, you got to refinance here and who cares if they went back up and then you refinanced again right here. So your payments kept going down. That's what happens as a homeowner. That's the value. That's the beauty of home ownership that people misunderstand. Everybody asks me, John, is this a good time to buy a home? What I just showed you is an explanation why it is. it can't be a bad time as long as you, the economy of you, can afford to make your monthly payment. That is the single most important thing that we have to figure out together. And it's not as simple as you think. Because people are so focused on, well, people who are, who are disciplined are focused on saving money. They're focused on building wealth. And what they miss is the fact that wealth is built through two vehicles. It's built through cash and it's built through equity. Now, when I say cash, I'm talking about investing money in something and those dollars return other dollars. That's your 401k. That's your stock investments. That's the money in your savings account and your CD. That's all cash. And in the beginning of your, of your adult life, even as a child, you're taught put money in cash, put money in cash, put money in cash. But what you don't realize is you have to counterbalance that. You have to offset the risk. All your eggs are in the one basket. And cash only grows so much over time. Now it grows, but it only grows so much. You get leverage when you have equity in something, okay? When you have ownership in it, and that way when the value goes up, and I showed you the chart about how much values go up over time. 
So as long as you can afford the monthly payment, and sometimes, a lot of times, it means you have to slow down or stop investing in your cash investments. Sometimes it means we've got to steal from those cash investments a little bit because you put a lot of money into your 401k. Then maybe you can afford to take two or three years off from investing in your 401k. Now, I know I'm going to get somebody giving me hate mail saying, oh my gosh, John, the 401k is the best vehicle for retirement. I think 401ks are amazing. Saves a lot of money for the average person. It gives them huge tax breaks, but nowhere near as much of the tax break as what you get being a homeowner. Nowhere near the amount of wealth building you get from being a homeowner. So when you think about buying a home and I say, hey, interest rates are as high as they have ever, well, not ever, high as they've been uh, I don't know. Gosh, I mean, I, let's just say this. We haven't seen rates this high really since 2005. So we've got rates as high as we've seen in 18 years right now. So is it a good time to buy a home? If you're simply focused on the interest rate, horrible time to buy a home. Absolutely the worst time to buy a home because interest rates are high. Now, if you look at house prices, is it a good time to buy a home? No, it's a horrible time to buy a home because house prices are high. But the fact is, interest rates will go lower because we see that cycle over time. But I just showed you 60 years worth of house prices, and guess what? House prices didn't go down. House prices continue to go up because people continue to make more money. And it is, people think, oh my gosh, I only got a 10% raise in my in my income, I can't afford to a 10% increase in my house payment. Your house payment is 30 or 40% of your income. So that means that you're spending 40 cents of every dollar you earn for a house payment. So if your income goes up by 10%, you've made 10 cents extra. If your house payment goes up by 10%, it only went up by four, four cents because it's only 40 cents on the dollar. So it, the math is not equal and people misunderstand that. But let's talk about you. Let's talk about, is this a good time to buy for you? And it really comes down to why do you want to own a home? And the funny thing is I sometimes talk people out of it. I talk people out of wanting to be a homeowner because it is not an easy time to buy a home. Now, I don't know if it's going to get easier or not, but it is one of the hardest times to find a home, to get an offer accepted. It is the negotiation. You would think the media wants you to believe that it is a buyer's market. Now, buyer's market means buyers have all the leverage because interest rates are super high and nobody wants to buy a home. So you can offer the seller whatever you want. But guess what? A lot of sellers aren't selling because they have one of these super low interest rates. So they're not selling their home. They're keeping that home because they've got a low payment. Why would they want to get rid of a 3% or a 2.5% interest rate and go move into something that has a higher interest rate and higher monthly payment? Very few of them are. Sellers are super happy. The American homeowner is better set right now than they ever have been. Matter of fact, I think it's why we're dealing with so much inflation because homeowners don't have a high house payment. Their income's kept going up. Their house payment's gone down. They have a bunch of money to spend even when the rest of us who aren't homeowners don't. So it's really, really important to make sure that you hop on that train. But the first piece of advice I'm gonna give you tonight, I've talked about a lot of things, but this is the most direct advice I can give you. Now is not the market to be looking for the perfect home. Now, you don't want to settle for something that you're going to hate. You don't want buyer's remorse. You don't want to deal with issues where you rushed to buy something that wasn't right. But I'll tell you what, houses are moving off the shelf very, very quickly. A couple of realtors I have on here right now can tell you that this is, this is a market that is not an easy market to succeed. We have multiple buyers buying. Now, it doesn't mean that they're buying it for 50 or 100,000 over the asking price yet, but here's the truth. There's a bunch of people who tried to buy homes in 2020 and 2021 that couldn't. And now they're waiting on the sidelines. They're waiting for interest rates to fall. And as soon as those interest rates fall, they're gonna storm the field and they're gonna be more competition for you than what you're dealing with today. So. There isn't a lot of inventory to choose from. Matter of fact, it's a pretty sucky time to buy a home because interest rates suck. The quality of houses or quantity, maybe the quantity of houses that are out there for sale right now sucks. There's not a lot to choose from. So you have to decide what can I compromise on? Am I willing to drive a little bit further? 
Am I willing to buy with a family member so I could stretch my dollars a little bit more? Am I willing to have a smaller home that maybe I can add on to later when interest rates come down? You've got to start thinking about what are you willing to, what are your must-haves? What are you willing to accept that is not the dream home? Okay, I watched the Barbie movie. I'm not afraid to admit it. You got bar all the Barbies are living in Barbie dream houses. That's not real life. In Barbie land, everybody gets a Barbie dream house except the Kens. The Kens don't get Barbie dream houses until they took over. But anyway, I won't spoil the movie for those of you who didn't see it. But the fact of the matter is you can't have your Barbie dream house every time you buy a home, especially not the first time you buy a home. It's a process of buying your first home, not buying your final home. And you got to understand that's what people have done for years. And we kind of got spoiled over the last 10 years. And people, because interest rates were so low, because their incomes kept going up, they got spoiled and thought, you know what? I'm going to buy a home just on one income. I'm going to buy a home. My spouse and I are both working, but I don't want to lose my home like my aunt did, like my grandparents did in 2007 and 2008. I'm not going to let that happen to me. So I'm going to make sure that I only buy a home that I'm positive I can afford the monthly payment on because I'm not going to let that happen to me. The problem is you're not likely to become a homeowner. In this market right now, August of 2023, if you really want to be a homeowner, you have got to find a great real estate agent that you trust. And if you don't have a great real estate agent that you trust, I can connect you with one. I know a lot of really, really good, in, uh, good real estate agents and a couple that you can trust. The fact is, your realtor is going to guide you on what it's going to take to get the offer accepted. Doesn't mean they're going to guarantee it gets accepted, but we got to step outside the box right now. We have to do some things that we haven't had to do at least in the last year or so because interest rates have gone up and it was a bit of a buyer's market for a period of time. And that time, that time's gone. Okay, we've missed that opportunity. And here's why. Because you are sitting here right now willing to think about buying a home even though interest rates suck. They're at seven plus percent. The difference is psychology. It's called recency bias. Whatever you saw most recently impacts what you think you should have today. So if you saw that interest rates, you're, when your friend bought a house a few months ago, were 2% cheaper, then you're going to think the current rate's super, super high. That was the case last year. In 2022, you were seeing interest rates go up by 1% or 2% in a 90-day timeline. We went from 3.5% to 7% in six months. That was crazy. I have never seen that in my 23-year career. And everybody freaked out saying, okay, well, it went up really quick. I'm going to wait until it comes down. Because what goes up real quick comes right back down real quick. Didn't happen. And now everybody's realizing, you know what? Seven's normal. And as more people think this is normal, more people are saying, I'm not going to wait. I've wasted my time waiting. I hate living with my in-laws. I hate renting from my landlord. I don't want to worry about fixing a house that ultimately is not mine because my landlord's not doing the work. So I got to do it myself if I want my kids to have a nice home that has the things that I'd like them to have. But you're not building a long-term legacy. You're not building wealth for yourself and for your family. And so you have to think, because here's my market update. It sucks. Interest rates suck. Housing prices suck. I know suck is my word of the day. Uh, I apologize if that offends you. I hope nobody's offended by me saying suck. Uh, but this sucks. Like it does. I'm just telling you the truth. And it's an amazing time to buy a home. You just have to compromise on what price you're willing to spend. You have to be willing to be, have be courageous in this market because there's a lot of homes that you have to write an offer on that maybe you have to waive your appraisal contingency. That's pretty scary. I'll tell you, an appraisal contingency is your protection that says, hey, if the house doesn't appraise for what the real for what I'm buying it for, I don't have to buy this house. But more and more, I'm seeing that that people are waiving their appraisal contingencies again. But there's strategies that we can protect you. And so you don't need to worry about, oh my gosh, am I going to overpay for a home and have to come out of pocket with a bunch of money that I don't have? But those things that we have to do right now in order to get our offer accepted, it's going to be even harder to do a year or two from now when interest rates come down. And at that point in time, interest rates are going to be lower and you'll think, wow, I can get a lower payment. No, because house prices will go up because more people will have come onto the field trying to buy homes. And so it's really, really important to understand this is 
a horrible time to buy a home because rates are high and because house prices are high. But one of those two things is going to change in the in the near future now. Am I talking months or weeks or years? I don't know. But at some point in the near future, we're going to see interest rates come back down. Will they go higher between now and then? I don't know. But let me leave you with one final thought about the market right now and whether it's a good time to buy. And that is only two things can happen with interest rates. If you buy a home right now and interest rates keep going up, you're going to be seen as a super smart person that bought before rates went higher. I have a lot of clients who bought homes in spring of 2022 as interest rates were going up and they had a rate of 4.75 or 5%. And man, did that sting because their friends had just bought a home six months ago at 3%. And now they're paying 4.75. But guess what? I said the same thing to them back then, which is, look, one of two things is going to happen. Either rates are going to keep going up, in which case you'll be glad you got this 4.75. Or rates are going to go down. And if they go down, we can refinance you and get you a lower monthly payments. Either way, you win. It's about getting in the game. It's like the lotto, you got to play to win. If you're not in the game of home ownership, you're just waiting from the sidelines and watching everybody else play and get the spoils. Okay. So what you have to do is you have to make a decision that says, okay, I know it's scary. I know rates are high. I know this payment is a lot, but Maybe I need to sacrifice something else that I'm saving right now. Maybe I need to not put as much money into the 401k or into my savings account and instead dive into home ownership, building equity, building wealth through home ownership. Because if rates go up, you'll be glad you bought now. If rates go down, you'll be really glad you bought now because you don't have to pay the higher prices and you get to refinance to lower your monthly payment. So I hope that was helpful. Um, again, I, I covered a lot of stuff there. One of the things that I said I was going to talk about is mortgage insurance, because it's one of the things when people talk about how much should I put as a down payment, they say, I don't want to pay mortgage insurance. And I got to tell you, mortgage insurance is nothing more than just extra interest. I don't want to pay extra interest. Neither do you. But sometimes it's the cost of home ownership. So mortgage insurance, as I said, it's a fee you pay to protect me, not you. It protects the banking world because the banking world previously was unwilling to uh, loan on a home unless you were putting your own 20% into it. So when you put less than 20% down on a conventional loan, you have to buy mortgage insurance, and that's a waste of money. But the alternative is a bigger waste of money. The alternative is you don't buy a home, and now you're wasting money in rents and now you're losing the opportunity to appreciate the value of your home. You're losing the opportunity to write off the interest on your taxes. Because when you make a mortgage payment, there's four parts to your mortgage payment, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Of those four things, you actually save money on three of them. Principal is money you're putting back in your pocket. Every single month you are paying down your balance, that's your future equity. That is your current equity that you get to get in the future when you sell the home. So the first part of your payment principal, that's your money. You're just putting it from one pocket to another. The next two parts, interest and taxes, those are both tax deductible. I don't know about you, but I didn't realize when I was born that I had a partner in life that I was stuck with financially, and that's my uncle, Uncle Sam. I'm stuck with paying my uncle a portion of the money that I earn, but I have some ways to get away with not paying him as much. And one of the ways is paying interest. High interest sucks, but high interest means you have a higher amount of a tax write-off. So you actually save more money on your taxes. Now, you don't save as much as what you spend. So don't get a high interest rate for the fun of it, but you don't have a choice. You can't get a low interest rate, but you by paying higher interest, you get a higher amount of tax savings. So it benefits you either way, taxes and uh, property taxes and homeowners, uh, home, home interest is tax deductible. The only part to those four that isn't a write-off is homeowner's insurance. And guess what? If you're a renter, you have to have insurance anyway. So everybody has to have insurance to protect themselves because we're a society that likes to sue each other. And so we have to have insurance. Okay, but really, really important to understand that mortgage insurance is nothing more than a tax that you pay for becoming a homeowner without having your own 20% down. But that tax isn't very much compared to the cost 
of not owning a home and what you're throwing away in rent. So I hope that helps. I'm going to go ahead and dive now into my presentation on kind of the process of owning a home. So give me one second to get this up and running. Um, all right. So we talked about, is this a good time to buy a home? So let's dive in now. If anybody has any questions, feel free to post them into chat. And let's go ahead and run my slideshow. All right. So here we go. So what do banks look for? When you think about the home buying process and you think about um, why uh, a bank is willing to do a loan or what things they care about in doing a loan, there's really three things that a bank cares about. They care about your cash. Now, I want to be careful here because cash is a four-letter word. Now, we all know that we were taught as kids, four-letter words, that means it's a bad word, John. Well, it is a bad word because cash, like green pieces of the paper with pictures of presidents, is bad because we don't know where that money came from. Now, I had somebody ask me today, John, I have money in the bank and I need to spend it on some stuff. Is that okay? Of course it's okay. If you spend your money, that's fine. But it's gone. You can't just replace it tomorrow with cash. You cannot deposit green pieces of paper with pictures of presidents because we don't know where it came from. So if you're depositing money, you have to make sure the money you're depositing is a traceable source. But you can get money from your 401k. You can take a, a loan against your 401k, you can take a disbursement, uh, in other words, liquidate your 401k. Uh, there's lots of strategies I can talk through with you, but the fact is your cash is the money you need for down payment, closing costs, and sometimes for reserves, and I'll explain what reserves are in a couple of minutes. The second thing we care about is your credits. Your credit is how well you've paid your bills in the past, and it's critical because it's our best indicator of how well you're going to pay your bills in the future. And yes, everything matters. You might say, John, I paid my rent on time, so therefore I'll pay my mortgage on time. Well, that's not how the banking world looks at it. We look at credit as a, as a big indicator of risk, of how responsible are you with your money and how much do we trust that you're going to use that money to make the payment on the mortgage before you use it to go to Vegas and bet on rent. So it's really, really important that you know what good credit is that you know how to build good credit. I've got some great videos on my YouTube channel about building credit and how to build credit and how credit works. Be careful what advice you take. As a matter of fact, don't even take my advice unless you are talking one-on-one -on -one with me. Because when it comes to credit, I can do a soft credit report. A soft credit report means that it doesn't hurt. It means that it doesn't cost you any money and it doesn't impact your credit score. So I'll do a soft credit report. It's kind of a sneak peek behind the curtain to say, hey, What's going on back there? Let's take a look without causing you any pain. It allows me to run what I what is called my credit simulator. Okay, I run my credit magic. My magic says, okay, here's your current credit. Here's where we want it to be. What things can we do? And the computer will actually use AI and it will predict what it thinks we should do. And then I take that and I plug it in manually. And I use my experience to come up with what I think we should do. And we have a game plan that's created for you. So if you're in a place where you think, you know what, I'm not ready to buy a home because I, my credit's not in a good place. Let's set an appointment to look at your soft credit and just see where you're at. And while we're at it, we want to look at how much money do you think you need to save and how much have you saved. And we're also going to look at the last thing, which is your income. Now, this is a piece that, that Roshana was talking to me about before or mentioned before. And she was asking about how to calculate debt ratio. And the, the, the debt to income ratio is really a pass or fail type of evaluation, unlike credit. Credit is shades of gray. Credit says you got great credit, you got almost great credit, you got a little less than almost great credit, all the way down to my credit's horrible uh, and really, really bad. So there's all these different ranges. We can do a loan with as little as a 550 credit score. Yeah, a 550 credit score. Now that doesn't mean I can do every type of loan at a 550 credit score. As a matter of fact, it's a very specific type of loan that only 13 different mortgage companies across the nation have authority to do that type of a loan. And it is a great way to help you buy a home. But some of the other things you've heard about in low down payments and down payment assistance, well, that doesn't apply when you have a 550 credit score. You're not gonna get the best interest rates when you have a 550 credit score. 
We're not going to be very forgiving on other things like how you can prove your income or how high your debt to income ratio is when you have a 550 credit score. But income to debt ratio isn't shades of gray. It's a pass fail. It's a yes, no. Now the uh, threshold, how much your income has to be relative to your debt changes based on the type of loan. But it doesn't matter whether you are way below the debt to income threshold or right up against it, doesn't matter. You get the same interest rate, you get the same deal because you can afford to make the monthly payment. Debt to income ratio is simply saying, I don't care how big your down payment is. I don't care if you're buying a $2 million home and I'm only loaning you $100,000. The federal government required in 2011, they passed a bill called the Financial Reform Bill, the Dodd-Frank Act. And it said every mortgage company that does a loan must prove your ability to repay the loan, your ability to repay the loan. So even though you are putting on a $2 million home, you're putting $1.9 million as a down payment and you're only borrowing $100,000. If you don't have any income or you have a brand new job uh, in a brand new industry that you're now self-employed and I can't count any of your income, I can't loan you $100,000 on a $2 million property. Now, having said that, I do actually have programs where with a big enough down payment and good enough credit, I don't need to prove any income at all but your interest rate's gonna be a lot higher. So you're not gonna get the best deal. Everything is a trade-off. Everything is a trade-off. So simply put, I will help calculate your debt to income ratio because there's a lot of things we don't include in there. We don't include utilities. We don't include your cell phone bill. We don't include what you pay for uh, travel and meals. We don't include what you pay for clothing but we include some things you might not think we need to include. Like we include what you will pay on a student loan even though you're not making any payments right now. So there's a lot of things that we look at. So calculating your own debt to income ratio, not really a uh, worthwhile activity. Let Leave it to the experts, by the way, I'm the experts. So leave it to me to help guide you through how to calculate your debt to income ratio. But the fact is income is the third most important key, but there's one more, there's a bonus question a bonus component, and that's the property. So I talk about cash, credit, and income as the three keys because they play off of each other. If you're weak in one, but you're strong in the other two, we can make it happen. If you don't have much cash, but you got great income and great credit, I got you covered. If you can't prove your income, but you got great credit and a big down payment, I've got you covered. If your credit is horrible, but you've got good, strong income and you've got a big down payment, I've got you covered. So you can be weak in any one of those three, but it's the, the if you're weak in two of them, that's where we're getting in trouble. When you're weak in three, that's where we're definitely creating a game plan. You'll never hear me say no. You'll just hear me say, not now. But the fourth thing doesn't apply to the first three. It's completely separate. No matter how good your credit is, no matter how big your down payment is, no matter how good your income is, the property must meet these three criteria, it must have the value you're buying it for. The property has to be worth, in the eyes of the appraiser, the amount of money that you're spending on it. It has to be in good enough condition, no health or safety hazards, and the type of property matters. So when I say, oh yeah, you're qualified with, you know, 5% uh, down payment, and you say, great, I'm buying a four unit property. Most four unit properties, I've got to have 25% down. Well, no, I'm gonna buy a manufactured home. Well, that program doesn't apply with manufactured homes. So there's the property is different most of the time. If we're not identifying, hey, I'm talking about manufactured homes, John, we're talking about single family residences, okay? All right, so speaking of which, let's talk about the down payment amount and specifically the, the cash, the credit and the income requirements. And I'm gonna briefly go over this because I don't want to spend too much time. Some of my other presentations, I go through this a lot deeper. But if you have questions, feel free to stop me. There are three different categories of loans. You've got conventional loans. Those are backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That's kind of the Coke and Pepsi of the mortgage world. They're pretty much the same, a little bit different recipe, but pretty much the same. And so you, with a conventional loan, you have a maximum loan amount of 726200 across the country, and in particular geographic areas, we can go above that, but there's a limit in each area. If you're above that limit, 
You have to go all the way over here. Do not pass go, go directly to Jumbo. Jumbo are loans that exceed the conventional loan limits. And so you have to go here. In the middle are what we call government backed loans. Now they have also limits and they vary annually by program, but that's FHA, VA and USDA. So what you notice is this middle category is the most forgiving. It has the smallest down payments with the lowest required credit scores. Matter of fact, we'll go down to a 550 credit score now on some of those loans. And they have the most forgiving debt to income ratio requirements. But you're gonna get the best deal on a conventional loan if you qualify. Conventional loans are a little bit harder to qualify for. And so your, your requirements, a conventional loan doesn't require 10% down, but it's ideal. A 10% down payment or better is ideal. You have to have at least a 620, but that doesn't guarantee you're qualified. A 740 or better is ideal, okay? Jumbo loans are a whole different category I'm not gonna get into. The requirements are even tighter and they're changing by the minute. But let's talk a little bit more about specifically down payment and closing costs. So you have to come up with both parts. You gotta come up with the down payment. VA and USDA only requires zero down payment. A conventional loan, even though I said that 10% down is ideal, the fact is a conventional loan only requires 3% down if you're a first-time home buyer. If you're not a first-time home buyer, you got to have 5% down. FHA is 3.5% down, and you don't have to be a first-time home buyer, and many people misunderstand that. You do not have to be a first-time home buyer to do an FHA loan. And then you have closing costs. I say it's an average of about 3%, but if you're buying a lower-priced home, you're looking at ten to fifteen thousand dollars because a lot of the fees are fixed. The money that my company charges, it's about one thousand eight hundred dollars for all the work that we do. It's the same whether you're buying a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar home or a two point five million dollar home. We're charging the same amount of money no matter what. So you got to be careful. On the low end, you're going to pay maybe more than three percent. On the high end, you're going to pay less than three percent because a lot of those fees are static. They're the same regardless of the price you're paying. Where can this money come from? Your down payment can only come from three places. It can come from your money. It can come from uh, a gift from family, or it can come from down payment assistance programs. The uh, Those are the only three places you can get your down payment. Closing costs can come from the same three things, but they can also come from a seller credit or a lender credit. For the sake of time, I'll simply say a lender credit isn't an option in today's market because rates are already really high and lender credits mean we charge you a higher rate in order to lower your fees. And that's really not a choice in today's market. A seller credit, I'm still getting contracts with seller credits, but they're harder to come by. As Raina said earlier, competition is definitely there. So getting a seller to credit you money, you got to look for the right circumstances. And that's where having a great realtor that you trust if you have a house that just went on the market, the seller thinks that's what their house is worth. They might even think it's worth more. They're not likely willing to accept a uh, giving you a seller credit the moment it went on the market. But if a house has been sitting on the market for two or three or four weeks, that's your opportunity to swoop in and save the day for the seller that's freaking out because they may not get their home sold and you can give them full price, but ask them to give you a credit towards your closing costs. All right. Uh, there are also lots of assistance programs out there. Here's just an example. There's some special grant programs that are out there for medical and healthcare workers, law enforcement, firefighters, people who work in education. And there's a weird program. I say weird because there's really no good rhyme or reason. But in the state of California, if you are an employee of, so you must work for one of these counties, you also have a special grant program that applies to you as well. So just something unique to kind of throw out there. But here's the deal, it's really, really tough time to get a mortgage. There's a lot of things that are changing in the, in the economy, in the banking world, uh, inflation. And so what you have to understand is this is going to be a turbulent process. As you go through the home buying process, we're gonna run into unexpected things, just like when you fly in a plane, you're gonna hit some warm air or cold air turbulence, whatever it is, you're gonna hit turbulence and the plane's gonna bounce and shake and you're gonna freak out, but just remember, your pilot that's in the cabin, that's the one that's guiding you. I'm your pilot. I'm here watching and making sure that things go well and that we get to our destination safe on time without crashing. So just recognize a great loan process isn't smooth all the time. Just like a great flight isn't smooth all the time. 
But the pilot's job is to make sure they didn't just pour, pour you hot coffee right before they hit a bunch of turbulence. So they do their best to make sure they time things so that the, they, they make this the bumpy parts of the ride not as bumpy as they could be. So let's talk through kind of how things go from here. Step one is you need to meet with me. So if you haven't met with me yet, at the end of, your, of, of this presentation, you're going to have a QR code that you can scan, that you can start the application process, you can download my mobile app, and we have to do a consultation. We're going to talk through all of your circumstances. I'm going to give you some financial education, and then I'm going to let you know, how, we're going to talk about two important numbers, what you're willing to spend per month and what I'll let you spend per month. And we'll figure out how to get those numbers closer together. Okay, those are the two most important numbers we talk about during our consultation. Once you're pre-approved, that's when you start searching for a home. Once you find a home, that's when we can lock in your interest rate. So most, almost every loan that I do is a fixed rate that's never, ever, ever going to change. But it's not locked in until you get an offer accepted on a home and we have a conversation about locking. So what I tell you about interest rates when you get your pre-approval letter, that is not going to be your interest rate when you get the home. Hopefully it's lower. The way things have been going, it might be higher. So just be aware of that fact that you cannot lock in the rate until you get the offer accepted on a home. Then we go through processing and underwriting. And during that process, we verify everything all over again. So we're going to annoy you. Uh, Mona asks, uh, is the consultation in person or over the phone? It's entirely up to you. There are actually three ways to do it. We can do it face-to-face -face in one of my two offices. I have an office in Roseville, California, and I have an office in Lodi, California. Uh, if that doesn't work for you geographically, the next best option is a Zoom meeting, very similar to what we're doing right now so that we can, so I can share my screen and I can show you what uh, your numbers look like. We can walk through everything. Worst case scenario, we do a phone conversation. That's my last uh, resort, my last alternative, because on the phone, I don't get to help guide you as well, because truth is half, more than half of communication is nonverbal. And so when I'm talking and I can see you, and I know you all have your cameras off right now, but when I'm talking and I can see you, I can better understand if you're understanding me and where your concerns lie or where the misunderstandings might be. And that helps me serve you to a higher level. So once we go through this process, we're going to annoy you. And we're going to ask you for everything all over again, new bank statements, new paycheck stubs. So be cautious about spending your money. Be cautious about running up your credit cards because I've had a few clients recently who had great credit here and then they ran up their credit cards and their scores fell and they didn't qualify anymore for the program that we had approved them for. Once we get through final approval, that's when you sign your paperwork and you bring in the rest of your money. So if I said, hey, you're going to need $30,000 to buy this home, well, um, one of my videos I did a few months ago, if you go back through a masterclass series on YouTube, you'll see I did a video, the first segment I did about... Um, how much money do you need to buy a home and when do you need it? What things do you have to pay for when? I'm not going to dive into that again, but I'll simply say up front you pay for certain things, but it's it's a few thousand dollars. The bulk of your money is brought in when you sign documents. And by the way, newsflash, signing of documents isn't going to be face to face with a human anymore. In 48 out of 50 states, California is not one of them, but in 48 out of 50 states, you now can buy a home fully digital. You do your signing of the loan documents via a Zoom-like conversation. You don't even have to have a notary come in. You sign most of the documents via DocuSign, and then you sign the last thing live in front of somebody. It's actually a really good thing. It's a big shift in the way things are going. But just understand, the signing of documents has really become digitized, and now notaries can do their job virtually in all but two states. California is one of them. I think... Uh, Somewhere on the East Coast is the other one. I don't recall which one it is, but just be aware the signing is now going to start moving more digital as we move forward in the coming years. And the final step is you move into your home. You get your keys. That's what we've been waiting for the entire time. All right. So I want to cover very quickly. Uh, I, I talked a lot about this in, in pieces, but I just want to say there are three major financial benefits of owning a home. And I'm pretty much going to wrap with this. And that is you get a tax write-off. You have a forced savings account and you get appreciation. I talked about all three of these things earlier on in this segment when I was talking about if now is a good time to buy a home and I kind of spursed it in, but this gives you a decent idea on a $350,000 purchase price. Your tax write-off is probably somewhere upwards of five or $600 a month in, in less taxes you owe to the IRS. Of that monthly payment that you're making, 
your $300 of that monthly payment is actually applied towards principal, which is money that is your own savings. And on average, house prices uh, go up by 3% per year across the country and around 5% in the coastal states, West Coast, East Coast, California being one of them. Uh, but we're just using a really conservative 2% number. That $350,000 home goes up by $7,000 a year on average, which is an extra $583 a month. So on a $350,000 home, you're getting $590 in tax write-off, $300 in forced savings, and $583 in appreciation for estimated monthly savings of $1,473 compared to if you were renting. Huge difference. So when you say, John, I can only afford a $2,500 a month house payment, well, you're comparing that to rent. But really, that $2,500 payment is a $4,000 payment once you factor in how much money you're really building in wealth. All right. So this is uh, the uh, scan this QR code. It'll actually have you download my mobile app. Within my mobile app, I have a calculator and I'll go quickly through here because this is a really great way to estimate monthly payments. A lot of people ask me, John, how do I figure out how much my monthly payment is going to be on a home? And this is the way that you're going to do it. And so what you're going to do is you're going to download my mobile app. So if you don't already have it, scan this QR code. And then you're going to, let's see if I can play this video. Here we go. So you're going to click right here on new purchase once you go in the calculator and you're going to pick one of these options on a loan type. So I picked a conventional loan. You got this little slider here that you move across to change the purchase price. And then you slide down and you update the interest rate. This is back when rates were at four or six. You can change whatever the rates are. Um, it defaults into a ballpark interest rate, uh, but that's the, the, it's not an exact rate. You can change what your down payment percentage is. So you're saying, hey, I want to put more or less down. And every move you make, changes this monthly payment at the top. And then you can go down here and hit calculate and it breaks it all down. You can click here on view and share and it actually creates, well, this one creates an amortization table and then you can create a PDF and you can share it with somebody. So you can run your own numbers and it will give you a complete breakdown of your monthly payment that you can share. So something important I wanna make sure that you have access to because the online payment calculators are very, very, very inaccurate. This is gonna give you a much better idea of monthly payment. All right, five reasons why you should work with me. Very simply, reputation. I'm good at what I do. And that really, really is important in this kind of a market where lenders are not all created equal and it's going to help you get your offer accepted. Number two, what we do ahead of the offer. When you work with a great lender, by the way, I'm talking about me, but I'm not the only one. We help you get your offer accepted. We call the listing agent. We're in constant communication with your buyer's agent to make sure, thank you, Raina, for saying that. Um, so Raina said, yes, he is, for those of you who aren't watching on Zoom. So um, it is, it, it's important what we do ahead of time to help you get your offer accepted. We can get your credit income and assets fully underwritten so that you can remove contingencies if necessary and provide a quick close if that matters to the seller. So guys, I'm going to end with this. Uh, we are right about a couple minutes past eight o'clock. So thank you. I have 100% of the people that started finished. Yes, I do. <laughs> I won. I kept you all for the entire hour plus. Anyway, if you have questions, now is the time to post those questions. Um, talking here about next steps. Hopefully my face is not blocking the QR code. So you can go to my website. Uh, apply.johnloanking.com. That's this first QR code up here on the top. And if you haven't already done so, please follow me on YouTube. Please uh, like my channel, subscribe to the channel, um, and share it so that you can help not only yourself, but other people that you know. I really put in a lot of time into educating. I think education is critical. As I said earlier, do not believe anything you read on the internet or listen to on the internet, including me but hopefully you can get a feel for who I am and how I do things so that you can say, hey, I'm not gonna take his advice until he gives it to me personally, but I can trust him because he's educating me without expecting anything in return. The only thing I expect is that you never, ever, ever do alone with anybody other than me. That's called subliminal messaging. I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. Anyway, uh, guys, I really appreciate it. If you have questions, again, I'm going to fill for about another 30 seconds, uh, but then I'll let you go. So I don't see any questions popping up. But if you do have questions, post them now. Otherwise, I really, really appreciate you joining me tonight. I do these master classes once a month. I also do another class uh, on the last Friday of the month, and that is to help prepare for the California Dream for All program. That's an amazing down payment assistance program that 
uh, came and went very, very quickly. And I want to educate people on what the program was, what I think it might be, some of the things you need to do to get prepared because the rules are going to change, but certain things we expect to stay the same. So if you're thinking about utilizing that program or you know somebody that might, that would be a great opportunity. Uh, you'll see that if you, uh, actually, you may not even, you may not see that on a YouTube channel, but uh, if you uh, if you go to my website, johnloneking.com, you should see it there. I hate to say, I don't know if it's even there. Email me uh, and we can get you registered for that. Anyway, I really appreciate your time. Clearly there are no questions, so I'm gonna let you all go. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and we'll talk to y'all soon. Good night.